want to learn how to manage your own investments? Are you ready to stop paying investment management fees and start building wealth? The DIY Investing Podcast is dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, and resources you need to be a better investor. Learn how to make investments through the use of fundamental analysis, mental models, and business management insights. Now, here's your host, value investing expert, Trey Henninger. Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing Podcast. My name is Trey Henniger and I'm your host. If you're listening to today's podcast and you haven't subscribed, please be sure to hit the subscribe button on your platform. If you're listening on YouTube, also hit the like button and it would be great if you could leave a five-star rating and review if you are enjoying this podcast. Thank you for your support. In today's episode, I am issuing all of you, my listeners, a challenge. The challenge is to answer this question. Would you buy your employer's stock? This challenge comes with a homework assignment. I want you to actually analyze this problem and decide why or why not you should buy your employer's stock. I want you to write it down and I want you to email it to me. We're going to dive into this podcast and this question. I'm going to talk about the types of things you should look for. I'm going to talk about the things you should be doing when you consider this problem. But I want you to write down the answer to this question. Write down the reasons, write it up in an email, and email it to me. I'm recording this podcast at the beginning of July 2020. And if you send me an email with your answers to this question... You can email me at trey at diyinvesting.org. If you email me that your answer in July, I will send you a response. I'll send you a response on what I think. It could be comments. It could be questions, things that you might want to consider. Um, and I'll, I'll give you feedback on that. So if you take the time and you do this homework assignment sometime in the month of July, I will do my best to send every single person a response to their answer. If you send it after July, I will still try and give you a response, but I'm only going to assure that for those who send it in July. Whether or not you listen to this while I'm sending this the first time or not, I think it's good practice, and you can always email me questions, investment ideas, that sort of thing, and I'll be happy to respond. So let's dive into this idea. So the first thing that some of my listeners may be impacted on is that their company is not public. Well, if your company isn't public, I want you to still assess your company. You can assess it qualitatively, and you'll just have to exclude the financials in this consideration, and that's just fine. Um, you'll still be able to assess, is this a high-quality company, all those sorts of things. You just might not have some of the underlying financial information. Alternatively, you can assess this for maybe your spouse's company or where one of the friends are that uh, where one of your friends works. The same is true if you happen to work for a nonprofit or government. Obviously, they don't have publicly traded shares. They're not an operating company. So consider uh, maybe your spouse's company or where a friend that you know works. Either way, I want you to choose a company that's closely related to either what you are working on or something that you really understand because it's someone that you're close to is working at. I think this is a good way to allow everyone to look at things that they operate on on a daily basis, areas that should fall within their circle of competence, and should be a good area to start when you're considering investing. I have considered whether I would buy my employer stock, and I think it's a good practice for every investor to have taken the time to consider, would they buy their employer stock? So, if you're going to do this, what are the questions that you want to answer? These are the sorts of things that I think you should be putting into a written response when you're trying to write up whether you or not to buy stock in your company. And again, this is applies whether your company is publicly or privately traded. These are the types of things you want to answer. The first thing you want to do is assess the industry. Is this a good industry to be operating in? Does the industry allow high returns on capital? Is there a lot of competition? Is there low competition? 
When there is competition, what is the competition based on? Is it based on price? That's a negative. Is it based on customer service? Sometimes that's positive because that could mean that you might have the ability to raise prices. Sometimes it's negative. What are the retention rates? How quickly do customers turn over? What is the primary goal of those customers? Business customers are going to have different needs of than, than consumers. You should understand that because the company you're working in, you're going to understand some of those needs. So what are the needs of the customers? And how does your industry look? Are there a lot of industry players? Are there a small number of industry players? All of those things go into assessing what the industry is. Is it the type of industry that you want to be invested in over the long term? The next step is to assess your company's place in the industry. Is your company the industry leader? Is your company the industry laggard? Are you somewhere in the middle? What determines the leader in this industry? Is it possible, if your company is a laggard, for you to eventually have the company be a leader? Are you gaining market share? Are you losing market share? These should be questions you should be able to answer simply by working at the company, but if not, you should be able to assess them by looking at the financials and assessing some of the competitors. So understand your company's place in the industry. Sometimes it's enough simply to be in a good industry, and sometimes if you're not in a good industry, you really want to be the leader in your industry. So where does your company lie in the industry outlook? The next question I want you to answer is what is the culture of your company like? This is a question that I think is very hard for most shareholders to answer about the types of companies they invest in because they don't know what the inside culture is like unless there's articles written about it, unless there's clear evidence of it, or you do a lot of scuttlebutt, it's really hard to know what the culture of a company is like. But if you worked at a company, if you interact with a company regularly, then you might be able to have a good understanding of what the culture is like. Is it combative? Is it cooperative? Is it competitive? How are people promoted? What is the pay compensation like? What are the incentive structures like? How do employees behave with other employees? How do employees behave with management? Are they focused on customer service? Is the company focused on cost savings? Is the company focused on growth purely for growth? Does the company consider capital in decision making? How does the spending structure of the company look like? Do you spend on anything you need? Do you, is it really Spartan? How well paid are the managers? Is this a company where you get a lot of perks for being in the company? Do you get a lot of travel benefits, a lot of spending limits that you can use, entertainment budgets? Or is this a company that doesn't have all that? What is the culture of your company like? What is the makeup of it? And how does that impact your feeling as a potential investor in your company? You see, when you're investing, you can always consider investing in your company if it's public. And since this is the company that you're probably going to know the most about, about any company in the world, you need to assess it. So what is the culture of your company like? Because if you can't assess the culture of your own company, then it's really hard to assess the culture of other companies. What is the priority of management? So this is really evaluating management. And here, it could be middle management, if you work fairly low in the organization. It could be upper management. It could be the CEO, C-suite. Um, this is really however you want to take this. Um, some of the questions, like are they shareholder friendly, really depends a lot on upper management. But it can apply throughout the organization. Or is the company focused on pleasing employees? Are they focused on pleasing customers? Are they focused on pleasing shareholders? Are they focused on pleasing um, non-government organizations, people like Greenpeace, environmental groups? Are they focused on pleasing government organizations, regulators, that sort of thing? Or are there other concerns that management has? Where is their priority? What are they focused on? What do they talk about? 
Um, what is the big thing that management wants to say when they have meetings? What is their focus? And how does that make you feel as a potential shareholder? Is that the sort of thing you want management focusing on for this company, for this industry? Next question I want you to answer is how are capital allocations made and how are CapEx decisions made? Um, Capital allocation is necessarily going to refer to the high levels of the C-suite. These are the CFO, the CEO. How are they allocating capital between different projects, different priorities, maintenance capital, you know, dividends, share repurchases. This is something that you're probably going to have to assess more from public disclosures, unless you're fairly high in the organization. But maybe they'll have discussion and communication down through the organization. But one that I think a lot of people might be able to know is, is how are capital, CapEx decisions made? Where is the capital expenditure being made within the company? Are you trying to grow? Do you have a lot of assets that you need to maintain? Is there a lot of maintenance expenditure? Is there inventory that needs to be bought? Maybe there is no inventory. All of these are important considerations for the quality of a business, for quality of management. So how are those capital allocation and CapEx decisions made? What is the focus? Are they based on certain return metrics? Do those return metrics matter to you as an investor? Do they appeal to you? Are they sufficiently high for you as an investor? These are important things for you to think about. Which leads directly into the next question. Does your company earn high returns on capital? And I want you to define high. So what does high mean to you? Is high 10%? Is high 20%? Is high 30%? What's a high return on capital in your business? They could be above average for the industry, but below average for your opportunity cost as an investor. Comment on that. Think about that. And if they have low returns on capital, why is that? What's the driver for the low returns on capital? If they have high returns on capital, why is that? What's the driver for their high returns on capital? Why does your company continue to exist and compete if they have low returns on capital? If they have high returns on capital, why are they able to retain that? What's the moat? Where's the competitive advantage? What do you think the secret sauce is that makes your company better than all the other companies that allows that return on capital be sustainable? Is it sustainable? I want you to assess that. I want you to write it down. I want you to think about how do these questions apply to my company, where I work? And this, I think, applies you know, to everyone. This applies to the individual investors who are doing this part-time. This applies to the professional investors that manage a fund as part of a potentially large organization. This can even manage, you know, apply to those professional investors that are their own employer. What is it that makes you better than other fund managers? These are the types of questions you need to think about because it's very important. You always have the option to invest in your own employer stock and you need to understand what the drivers are for the shareholder returns for that company. Does your company use leverage? Is debt purely used to boost financial returns or is it required simply to earn a a sufficient return for investors? A good example is utility companies. Utility companies in general have very low returns on asset. And without, av- without leverage, they would not be good investments for investors. So if you work for a utility, that's one of the things you're going to think about. Some companies need a lot of leverage. Some companies don't need a lot of leverage. Does your company need a lot of leverage? Just because it has leverage doesn't mean it needs leverage. You'll see a company like Philip Morris International make cigarettes. They don't need leverage, but they use leverage to pay higher dividends and share repurchases than they otherwise could, simply because they have the freedom to do so. They can support the leverage. So where does it apply for your company? In summary, what you're trying to get here for your company is, is it a high quality business? Is the company I work for high quality? Is this a company that I want to own stock in? Why or why not? And you need to understand that you need to write it down because what you have to understand is that one of the problems throughout for every investor is opportunity cost. There's always 
choices to be made when you put an investment. If you're going to make an investment of $5,000 or $10,000 in company A, then you're giving up the chance to make that same $5,000 investment in company B or company C or your company. Your employer stock is usually, for most people, an option to invest in. Now, there's a lot of private companies and you might not be given that option. But if you go high enough in a company, maybe you will be given that option, even if it is private. Maybe you get stock options. Maybe it's owned by a private family, but they're willing to bring in a minority shareholder. Um, Many people who have to make this sort of decision are in companies like law firms. You know, if they're trying to become partner, what that means is they're going to buy into or receive some of the share profits of that firm, that law firm. That's what it means to become partner. So some of these professional organ- companies, this is something to think about. Is this a high quality company that you want that? It's not simply a means of getting higher compensation sometimes. Sometimes you need to understand are the, what are the risks involved? And that's really the thing you need to understand here. So after you've assessed, is it a high quality business? What are the risks to my company? Where can the company have problems? Are you worried about competition? Are you worried about obsolescence due to technology? Are you worried about, um, you know, competition's a broad term, but are you worried about people stealing your customers? Are you worried about your customers, you know, displacing you? If you're a middleman, can they find a way to vertically integrate or horizontally integrate to get rid of you from their supply chain? Um, Are you worried about outsourcing or are you worried about insourcing? These are the things that I want you to consider. You know, what are the risks to an investment in your company? What are the things that you would worry most about if you were a shareholder? And finally, and I think this is what is very important, is you need to write down a value for your employer stock. So if your company is public, there's no reason for you to not be able to write down an explicit intrinsic value for your company stock. You'll have access to the financials. You'll be able to see and look up how much money your company makes. You're going to be able to see that the history of the company's earnings, and you're going to be able to estimate an explicit intrinsic value. So if you're going to send me an email, I want you to write down an explicit intrinsic value, and I want you to justify it. What is your method for coming up with that number? What multiple are you putting on earnings? Did you do a discounted cash flow? You know, if, you li- if you've listened to this podcast, you've heard me talk about various methods of valuing companies. So I want you to do that calculation, write it down, and have that be part of your email that shows why or why not you should buy that company. And after you've written down that intrinsic value, only then would I recommend looking at the stock price. I want you as much as possible to not look at the price of your employer's stock through this entire process. You're trying to evaluate the stock without considering how other people value it. How do you value it? Knowing what you know, maybe knowing stuff that other people don't know, but knowing what you know, how would you value this company? And then would you buy it? Maybe you would buy it because it's a good price. Maybe it's a good price, but you have better opportunities. Write that down. This is not simply an activity to fill time. It's a learning. It's practice. And it's important for you to practice on companies that you know and understand first. There's no better starting point than your own employer's stock. So you don't have to send your write-up to me, but I encourage you, whether you send it or not, to write it down. Because by writing it down, you'll clarify your thoughts. I can't tell you how many times I've thought about investing in a company, and then I go to write down a thesis for why I'm buying it, and it doesn't make sense, so I don't buy. That saved me from countless mistakes by writing down my thesis, writing down my thoughts. It's very easy to convince yourself in your head of something being a good deal, until you have to write it down and get it out of your head. So that's the challenge for this week. Again, you can email me your write-up at trey at diyinvesting.org. That's T-R-E-Y at diyinvesting.org. 
and I will take the time to reply with comments or questions to anyone willing to send me their write-up, send me their homework assignment um, for why they think their company is a good or bad investment. You're supposed to assess the quality of the company and the potential value of the company. Now, if it's private, you won't be able to write down intrinsic value. Um, so maybe also practice on a company, like I said, of a spouse or a friend that is public. And that would be also good practice. But your best practice is going to be about your own employer um, because you understand it in a way that many people probably don't, that they would have to do scuttlebutt research to learn some of the stuff that you just know from your day-to-day -day work. So that's today's podcast. It's not going to be super long. I just wanted to present some ideas for you. I wanted to challenge you to do the work to evaluate a company this month. And I think it's a good idea to start with your employer. So thank you for listening to this today today's podcast. I hope you found it valuable and I hope you take the time to learn with this challenge that I'm setting for you. Please remember this is, you can find the full show notes for this episode, including my outline for today's podcast at DIYinvesting.org slash episode 84. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth. Thank you for listening to the DIY Investing Podcast. Please visit our website and subscribe to our email list at DIYinvesting.org for guides, videos, and resources to help make you a better investor. The DIY Investing Podcast is presented for general informational and entertainment purposes only. I have not considered your specific situation or risk profile, and I have not provided investment advice. The information presented on the DIY Investing Podcast should not be construed as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed on the DIY Investing Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's host or sponsors. DIY Investing, its producers, sponsors, and host, Trey Henniger, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based upon information or viewpoints presented on the DIY Investing Podcast.